energized and, and happy to be here. I'm so glad to see you all here with us tonight. Welcome to Sagatuck Church on behalf of Wakeman Town Farm and Sustainable Westport. We are thrilled to have you joining us this evening together. My name is Natalie Owens Pike, and I am the sabbatical pastor here at Sagatuck Church. Um, I'm covering for uh, Reverend Allison Patton while she's away on sabbatical until September. And Reverend Patton is um, exploring how um, coastal ecosystems are preparing for and handling climate change, as well as pursuing her own renewal. And so as a congregation, we had the opportunity to think about how to address climate change as a community and how to pursue our own renewal. And one of those things, one of those passions that came about was how people of faith can address the climate crisis. And uh, I'm really excited to welcome this amazing group of speakers and presenters tonight who are gonna share a little bit about how that work is already happening in this community and uh, how we can uh, join in and take a role in that. So I, I wanna acknowledge that we gather here on land that was stewarded for generations by the Pagasset and other indigenous nations from whom this church gets the name Sagatuck and from whose continued relationship to this land and to all communities along the coast is essential to our shared work of climate stewardship. For this we give thanks and we commit to working beyond just acknowledging these relationships but working together for climate action. We're so glad you're here because the challenges that we are facing are greater than any one of us, any one person or community or town or organization. And you might be here because you already recognize that. And you might be wondering just how can we work together beyond the individual steps it's gonna to take to make collective action towards climate progress. So you'll hear tonight um, from some of these wonderful presenters who will share for, um, for us some actions we can take. And we're inviting you to consider tonight not just what's necessary, for us to face the climate challenges ahead, but what might be possible when people of faith to go join together with community and civic leaders to create change. So even though the reality is that we're facing of climate change, sometimes when I hear a litany of statistics or facts about what's coming, I might feel a little bit of despair or, um, or fear about what we can really do to make an impact. But as we were gathering together to talk about what we could share for tonight's program, I was really surprised by how much joy we shared in getting to know the work that we're each doing, in seeing what's already happening in this community, shared joy at the passion and the vision and the conviction that each of these presenters shares with us tonight. So I hope that you get to experience a little bit of that too, taking with you some joy and some vision and conviction for how we can move forward. So I have the pleasure now of introducing our keynote speaker, the Reverend Dr. Jim Antall. Jim is a lifelong climate activist and author, including the book Climate Church, Climate World. He is a leader in the United Church of Christ, a public theologian, and in addition to his years of work as a local church pastor, he's the former leader of all of the Massachusetts churches of the United Church of Christ. So there are about 400 churches in Massachusetts. Jim has also been a teacher, a chaplain, and is a graduate of Princeton University, Andover Newton Seminary, and Yale Divinity School. And we have the pleasure of enjoying Jim's company for three weeks here in Westport and at Sagatuck. Jim is meeting with our youth, preaching from this pulpit, and working together with these wonderful organizations gathered tonight in service of climate justice. So I invite each of you back um, for any of the events that we'll be hosting here, including Sunday worship. Please join me in welcoming Jim. So uh, I want to begin by uh, expressing my gratitude to our host, the Saugatuck Congregational Church, for making it possible for me to be part of your community uh, as you uh, think about uh, making Westport a sustainable place. 
Uh, and also, uh, I want to thank the other sponsors of this gathering, Sustainable Westport and the Wakeman Town Farm, and our moderator, Peter Boyd, who you will meet in a minute, but I had the pleasure of having lunch with today, and um, I, I, any of you would have loved to listen in on our uh, enthusiastic conversation. But let me begin by saying clearly that every, every living thing, life as humans, have always known it on Earth, our common home, is in jeopardy. The choices we make and the actions humanity takes over the next few months and years will determine the peril and the possibility to which we and our children and all future generations will be subjected. It falls to us, to our generation, to welcome as an opportunity the rapid systemic changes our civilization must undertake. The scientists have put us on notice. The engineers are providing all the solutions we need. Activists, including scientists, are courageously speaking truth to power as they use their bodies to sound the alarm. However, with a few notable exceptions, corporate and financial leaders remain focused on short-term profits while ignoring systemic inequality. And too many political leaders have thus far lacked the commitment, the courage, or the ability to offer the inspiration humanity needs to engage this challenge. Yes, it now falls to you and to me and everyone who is alive today. Each of us has a pivotal role to play in assuring that humanity bends the moral arc of the universe toward justice and interdependence, even as we bend the ecological arc of the earth toward sustainability, renewal, and restoration. In hope of igniting the resolve to initiate a new moral era, I will first share a few examples of the impact climate change is already having, what we can expect, and how the climate intensifies other injustices. Then we will examine humanity's role in creating, continuing, and countering the greatest moral challenge humanity has ever faced. Finally, we will examine how the climate justice movement is asking us to embrace a fresh understanding of human freedom, fulfillment, and vocation as we create an unstoppable mandate to restore creation. So let me begin with some good news. 85% of Americans agree that we have a moral responsibility to create a safe and healthy environment for ourselves and for our children. Americans who think that global warming is happening now outnumber those who think it is not happening by more than six to one. And for the first time, a majority of Americans now say that people in the United States are being harmed right now by global warming. Amidst the ongoing wrangling of our elected leaders in Washington, D.C., it's important to recognize the environmental sea change that occurred in January 2021. Since he took office, President Biden has overturned 80 of former President Trump's deregulation actions and is working to roll back another 91. In addition, Biden has approved 50 new policies and is working to add another 42. The $1.15 trillion infrastructure bill Congress passed last fall includes over $200 billion for climate-related projects. Climate change is now a national security priority for the Pentagon. 
the Justice Department, the Energy Department, and the Environmental Protection Agency are now focusing on environmental justice, which prompted Bob Bullard, who is widely considered to be the founder of environmental justice, to say, environmental justice is not a footnote anymore, it's a headline. Across the country, people are beginning to realize that environmental justice is jobs with justice. Environmental justice is housing justice. Environmental justice is health justice. Environmental justice is, of course, climate justice. Environmental justice is indigenous justice, and environmental justice is racial justice. In response to the actions President Biden took his first week in office, Bill McKibben declared that this was the most remarkable week in the history of America's official response to the climate crisis and that it may well mark the official beginning of the end of the fossil fuel era. True as that may be, in the 17 months since then, Congress has been able to pass only a small fraction of the funding and legislation that is urgently needed. And as we all know, our focus on the need for immediate climate action has been further compromised by the horror of Russia's war in the Ukraine. There's one more piece of good news I'm excited to share. Over a decade ago, Bill McKibben initiated the climate movement when he and a handful of college students launched 350.org. Less than a year ago, Bill McKibben, who just turned 60, uh, is now launching a new organization for elders. And there are a few elders in the congregation and on, uh, online tonight. And it's called Third Act. Third Act, a national climate justice organization for experienced Americans, age 60 and up. I would urge any of you who are over 60 to check out www.thirdact, and that's third spelled out, T-H-I-R-D, act.org, so that you can sign up. It would be great to have a Westport chapter of Third Act emerge from tonight's conversation. Now let me illustrate why it's urgent that we take action on climate immediately. For the past two summers, regions as much as 70 miles above the Arctic Circle were overcome by a daytime high of 50 degrees above normal, hitting an all-time high of 118 degrees Fahrenheit. And three months ago, places in Antarctica on the other side of the world were 70 degrees Fahrenheit above normal. We now know that air pollution caused by the burning of fossil fuel kills almost 9 million people a year. That's more than malaria, HIV AIDS, and tuberculosis combined. And that doesn't even include the lives lost due to the impact of increased global warming. A 2021 study reports that if global warming exceeds the 1.5 degrees centigrade uh, limit uh, that the UN um, uh, gathering in Paris put on it, the world's tropics could become uninhabitable. 2.5 billion people live in the world's tropics. In other words, the past decade has been the hottest decade since records have been kept, and the past decade will be the coolest decade that your children or your grandchildren will ever experience. Rather than offer more examples, let me provide some perspective. If you look back in time at Earth's climate, you'll see that it, it's only over the past 10,000 years, about 400 generations, that climate has provided humanity with a stable enough pattern for people to depend on. In fact, it's that dependable climate 
that allowed humanity to settle down, to farm our own food, and to live in year-round communities. Thus, civilization emerges from and depends upon a stable climate, or what I like to call the continuity of creation. But that continuity is now broken. Once the industrial era began, it took us only seven generations to decreate the planet. Over the past 200 years, humanity has extracted and burned about half the oil, coal, and gas that nature took more than 150 million years to create. That's how the developed countries built the modern world. In doing so, a tiny percentage of us became unimaginably wealthy, profiting from the control over and abuse of resources that they had nothing to do with creating. At the same time, a majority of people worldwide are living with increased inequality, poverty, hunger, homelessness, and lack of potable water. These injustices are all casualties of the unjust acquisition, extraction, distribution, and profit from the energy stored under our feet. And to address these injustices, humanity must complete the greatest transition we have ever attempted, moving from our dependency on fossil fuel to a reliance on renewable and sustainable forms of energy. And as many of you know, we can do this. We already have all the solutions we need to undertake this transition. A group of the world's top climate scientists recently issued a report indicating that by 2030, electricity from solar, wind, and water could provide all the electricity the world needs. And by 2035, renewable energy could also be the sole energy source for all the world's heating, cooling, transportation, and industry. Not only that, but we can make this transition in a way that addresses economic and racial inequities. And by doing so, we will reap benefits far greater than the costs. So what's been holding us back? If all the solutions are available today, why haven't politicians, industry leaders, and consumers embraced those solutions? What's been keeping us from this necessary transition? Here a little history is helpful. Way back in 1965, when President Johnson received the first report on global warming, he responded by saying, the destiny of humanity and the rest of creation are intimately linked. We flourish and we perish together. In 1970, the first Earth Day saw 20 million Americans take to the streets. It took only a few months for Congress to create the Environmental Protection Agency and to pass the Clean Air Act. Two years later, Congress passed the Clean Water Act, and a year after that, Congress passed the Endangered Species Act, and President Nixon signed them all. And it's worth remembering that in 2006, President George W. Bush, the former oil man from Texas, declared America is addicted to oil and insisted that the United States break this addiction. So if presidents of both parties express these kinds of concerns, something else must be going on. Of course, there are many factors, but the driving reason we have not taken, we have not broken our addiction to fossil fuel is that since their inception, fossil fuel corporations have had one and only one goal, to make the most money for their shareholders in each quarter. Keeping that goal in mind, here's some additional history. 
In 1975, when the fossil fuel corporations heard that the world was on the brink of global warming, they quickly hired some of the best climate scientists in the world. In 1982, those scientists told the board of Exxon that climate change is caused by humans burning fossil fuel, it's getting worse, and the oceans are absorbing most of the excess CO2. But that will not continue indefinitely. Then Exxon hired the, the best ocean scientists they could in order to confirm those findings. And, at about, and, and they did confirm those findings, in fact. However, at about that same time, Exxon's mechanical engineers reported a breakthrough in their ability to drill horizontally into shale. And that allowed them to extract more natural gas than anyone could imagine, what we today refer to as fracking. So what did Exxon do? First, they fired those climate scientists and buried their reports. And then Exxon hired a few fake scientists, the same fake scientists that the tobacco industry had hired in 1978. Just as these fake scientists had sown the seeds of doubt about whether smoking causes cancer, they began to sow the seeds of doubt about whether climate change was real. Over the past three decades, fossil fuel corporations and their think tank partners have spent hundreds of millions of dollars on this disinformation campaign and supporting politicians who will do their bidding. To this day, America remains the only place in the world where climate denial has any political or cultural traction. To learn more about this, I would highly recommend that you watch the documentary movie, Merchants of Doubt, which thoroughly examines the issue of science denial funded by fossil fuel companies. This documentary is based on a book by the same name, Merchants of Doubt, written by my friend Harvard professor Naomi Oreskes. Also, PBS just released a frontline series, a three-part frontline series, uh, which is on this exact same issue. So with this as a backdrop, let's look for a minute at the emergence of the climate justice movement. And to set the stage, we need to go back to the 1980s. Poor black farmers in Warren County, North Carolina, were protesting plans to dump 10,000 truckloads of cancer-causing waste material in a toxic waste dump that would leach into the water supplies. When UCC minister, I, when I say UCC, that's my denomination, the United Church of Christ and the denomination of this church. When UCC minister Ben Chavez went to provide them with some support, he was thrown in jail along with over 500 black protesters, mostly farmers and women. From his jail cell, he shouted, this is environmental racism. Their battle to stop that landfill was lost. But in 1987, my denomination and the denomination of this church, the United Church of Christ, released our historic report, Toxic Wastes and Race. And in 2020, we updated that report, and it was called Breath to the People. It showed that here, in the richest nation in the world, well over 100,000 children under the age of five live within three miles of the 100 most polluting facilities in America, areas often referred to as sacrifice zones. And this leads to the emergence of the climate justice movement. At about the same time that Senator James Inhofe from Oklahoma declared that his God would never allow climate change, a group of Middlebury College students and their professor began planning a day of climate actions. And lo and behold, 
In 2007, activists emerged in 1,400 towns and cities all over the United States. A year later, these young people founded 350.org and the climate movement began. Only a movement could turn the ship of state. Only a movement could counteract the hundreds of millions of dollars spent by the fossil fuel industry on climate denial advertising. Only a movement could compel politicians who have been bought by the fossil fuel industry to declare a change of heart. The emerging climate movement is different from the environmental movement of the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s in several crucial ways. First, in 2011, the climate movement began to focus on the supply side of the problem. Our first goal was to stop the Keystone XL pipeline from being built. Our witness began when 1,253 of us were arrested in front of the White House. 63 of us spent three days and nights in jail. On Ash Wednesday in 2013, I was again arrested with 50 others, again in front of the White House. The campaign was driven by indigenous leaders and cowboy landowners. Obama heard us, then Trump overrode Obama, and on his first day in office, Biden finally canceled the Keystone XL pipeline. This 10-year-long struggle has prevented well over 3 billion barrels of the dirtiest crude from being extracted and burned. The Keystone campaign inspired hundreds of additional protests. Many have succeeded in canceling countless unneeded pipelines. Some have failed. The indigenous leaders at Standing Rock inspired thousands to join them and put their bodies on the line. Likewise, the faithful indigenous leaders in Minnesota have done the same as they protest the construction of a pipeline called Line 3. All of these actions focus on the supply side, or as the campaign is sometimes called, keeping it in the ground. Another supply side focus is the divestment movement. My denomination, the denomination of this church, the United Church of Christ, uh, led the way in this effort, becoming the first religious organization and the first national organization to vote to divest from fossil fuel holdings in July of 2013. And in less than 10 years, portfolios worth over $40 trillion, that's trillion with a T, portfolios worth over $40 trillion have purged their holdings of fossil fuel stocks. Because fossil fuel companies continue to do all they can to expand their infrastructure so that they can extract still more fossil fuel, they need funding. And this has birthed another supply side campaign called Stop the Money Pipeline. Jane Fonda and thousands more have been pressuring J.P. Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, Citibank, and Bank of America and other banks to stop lending money to fossil fuel companies so that they can build new fossil fuel infrastructure. Since the Paris Agreement, over $1.3 trillion has been lent to fossil fuel company to find yet more oil and gas underground. More recently, over a thousand scientists risked, scientists, mind you, risked arrest by putting their bodies on the line in 25 countries as they sounded the alarm about the urgency and injustice of the climate crisis. My friend, NASA climate scientist Peter Kalmus was among them. He was arrested at the Chase Bank in Pasadena, where he works, protesting Chase Bank's funding of new fossil fuel infrastructure. And I come from a family of scientists, and I can tell you, scientists and civil disobedience is not something that normally goes together. 
Another way in which the emerging climate justice movement is different from the environmental movement of the 70s, 80s, and 90s is that the climate justice movement, it's an intersectional movement. Since its beginning in 2007, the climate movement has been increasingly led by people of color and indigenous people. But that's not all. The more you learn about the climate crisis, the more clear it becomes that every justice issue you care about, hunger, poverty, homelessness, immigration, disease, lack of access to clean water and education, these justice issues are intersectional. They are not separate and distinct from one another, and climate change will make and is making every one of them worse. All of you know that the systemic racism has been choking America for centuries. But here's how 17-year-old climate activist Alexandria Villasenor puts it. The exploitation of black people is the greatest extractive system of production of all time. Thanks to the Black Lives Matter movement, many churches and other houses of worship have begun to examine their white privilege and how their white privilege is secured by the guardrails of injustice, inequity, and inequality. And all of us are also learning what black and brown and indigenous people living in America have known for generations, that they are living their lives amidst the public health crisis. Not only that, we're all realizing that we are no longer living on the same planet we used to call home. And black and brown and indigenous people know this best because most of them already are dealing with the consequences of the climate crisis. Now there's one additional distinctive feature of the climate movement. It's now being led by youth. Their audacious vision, their unbound courage, their uncompromising commitment, their brilliant strategic messaging on social media, all of these qualities have earned the respect and renewed the hope of millions of people worldwide. So in wrapping up, let me conclude by saying that I believe it's up to our generation to live into a new story, a fossil fuel free story, a story in which we join millions of others as we realign our time, our energy, our gifts, our attention, and our assets to respond to the call now heard around the world. And what will fuel this effort? Gratitude. By gratitude, I'm not referring to the nostalgic thankfulness for having experienced what was and is no more. I'm referring to gratitude for having been given the opportunity to be part of what is the most consequential generation of human beings who have ever lived. You and I and everyone else who is alive today has been given the opportunity to abandon a destructive story of rugged individualism, exploitation, anthropocentrism, racist inequity, colonialist extraction, and environmental degradation. And in its place, to create a new understanding of interdependence, resilience, wonder, moral imagination, moderation, justice, and vision. Again, let me say, we can do this. I look forward to our discussion time when we can explore the countless ways Westport and Fairfield County can become a climate leader. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jim. This is a good moment. Uh, if Jim's remarks brought up a question for you to jot that down on your Q&A paper that was given to you with your program. 
and our ushers will be circling around between the presentations to pick those up if you have them ready. You can just wave them in the air to let them know your question's ready. So we're gonna turn now to our, our co-sponsors and presenters. First, we'll hear from Wakeman Town Farm and then from Sustainable Westport. And we are joined tonight by Haley Schulman, who sits on the board of Wakeman Town Farm and has for a year. She uh, is passionate about sustainable food systems and volunteers with the animals at Wakeman Town Farm in addition to coordinating events and educational programming there. She is also the coordinator for Food Rescue US, which is a nonprofit on a mission to reduce food waste and food insecurity. And she also works at the Westport Farmer's Market. So we are blessed to have Haley with us tonight. Let's give her a warm welcome. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. That is a hard act to follow, but I'm feeling good about it. I hope you all are as jazzed and inspired as I am um, after what we all just witnessed. Um, so I am curious, hoping to get some, a show of hands. Um, who has been to Wakeman Town Farm in Westport? Okay, awesome. I love that percentage. Next time I'm here, I'm looking for a full 100. Uh, so Wakeman Town Farm um, is a two-acre farm in Westport with a rich history in the community. Um, and actually, next slide, please. Uh, so here listed is both our mission and vision. Our mission is Wakeman Town Farm Sustainability Center is an organic demonstration homestead dedicated to serving the Westport community. The farm is a model facility created to educate the community with local healthy food production, responsible land stewardship, sustainable practi practices, and community service orientation. Activities include educational workshops, student internships, after school environmental clubs, children's summer camp programs, growing of fruits and vegetables, animal husbandry, providing a farm stand, and newly, a home gardener donation drop-off point. Uh, while that was a mouthful, our motto is not. Um, we believe and we wish um, that you should all grow your food and know your food. So at our core, we encourage knowing what is in your soil, how to treat your soil, the importance of healthy soil, and knowing and understanding the pleasure in cultivating and consuming your own grown food, and that is how we promote sustainability. Next slide. Uh, so a brief history of this farm. In 1905, John Wakeman buys the home and farmland located at 134 Cross Highway. Throughout the 1940s and 1960s, excuse me, Wakeman Town Farm expands from strictly a dairy operation to include poultry. They later add fruits and veggies. At the height of the growing season, the farm sold more than 5,000 ears of corn each weekend. That is a wild amount of corn. <laughs> in 1970, Isaac and Pearl Wakeman sell their 41-acre property to the town of Westport, retaining a lifetime lease on the house and the surrounding three acres. In 1994, part of the Wakeman farmland acreage becomes the Wakeman Park Athletic Fields, which many of you may be familiar with today. In 2010, Pearl Wakeman passes, um, and the town of Westport rents the property to the nonprofit Green Village Initiative. In 2011, GVI leaves the town uh, and appoints Elizabeth Beller, Liz Milwee, and Kathy Talmadge to run the first town-run farm in Westport. Uh, and Liz and Kathy are still in leadership roles at the farm today. Next slide. Um, so what we do, we host workshops, lectures, and classes to educate the community. Um, we've hosted informational sessions on the impacts of gas leaf blowers on the environment and, and um, human health. We regularly include compost how-to talks and workshops for kids and adults, many of which can be found on our website. We educate school groups at every age level about our sustainable practices, again, including composting, food rescue, and organic farming. We hold workshops to instruct the community on sustainable and habitat-friendly garden practices. We teach the community how to winter sow using upcycled plastic bottles and we demonstrate how our animal fleece can be processed and woven. We also practice what we preach. 
We focus on the growing of food. We focus on organic practices, purposefully using our farm stand to educate the community on the importance of local and seasonal produce. Um, that is a very self selfless plug for our farm stand opening this Saturday from nine to two. Uh, there you can speak with our farmers and master gardeners um, who work the stand and are there specifically to educate you on these practices. We walk the walk by actively using our compost in our farming practices. We educate our culinary program participants about recycling vegetative waste in our greens compost bin. We always ask ourselves which is the most sustainable choice to adopt our new farming practices, whether it be pest control or fertilization or other horticultural methods. Uh, we initiate and support the creation of Westport's pollinator pathway to promote more sustainable lawns and gardens. This is another plug that there will be a multi-town pollinator pathway tour later this month. Uh, we feature native plants in our pollinator border and garden beds wherever possible. We partner with Sustainable Westport and other sustainable groups in the community. We encourage event participants to avoid wasteful single-use containers and properly dispose of recyclables. Uh, we, um, recycle, we recycle arborists, wood chips, and packing box cardboard to make paths and weed block areas. Using our farm's animals to help control and consume weeds. We tr we've transitioned to electrically powered landscape care when feasible. And of, of course, adherence to organic farming pr principles. We also use our resources to serve the community. We share our extra seedlings with the senior center. We allocate a raised bed for the exclusive use of the Greens Farms Garden Club to cultivate and share those veggies with underserved communities in our neighboring towns. Uh, we use painted instructions on our compost bins as passive education on composting methods. Um, we also allow for um, the community to take our compost for free or our brown gold. We recycle leaves from the town as much as we can, as mulch, excuse me, in our garden beds. Uh, we give the leftover excess produce from our farm stand to organizations through Food Rescue US. We also will be a, um, as of this Saturday, a drop-off point for home gardeners with excess in their gardens to donate through Food Rescue US as well. So what we need from you, be open to learning. Attending things like this talk is absolutely a step in the right direction. Take classes at places like Wakeman Town Farm promoting sustainable living. What I find most importantly, lend a helping hand. If you speak to any nonprofit, they will tell you that volunteers are the backbone of what they do. It is absolutely true. There are many ways that you can engage with these nonprofits. Find something that you are passionate about, um, and I assure you there is a nonprofit equally as passionate and eager for your help. Uh, little changes make a big difference. We all have to start somewhere. While that plastic water bottle may not change the world, it may inspire your next thought that will. Thank you. Thank you so much, Haley. Um, on the back of your program tonight, you'll find also some suggestions that uh, Wakeman Town Farm and Sustainable Westport have put together for you, just a way to kind of keep you thinking as you leave the event tonight of what you can do to take this learning forward. So next we will hear from Gate Lee Ross from Sustainable Westport, and Gate Lee joined Sustainable Westport as the co-director there in September of 2021. She has dedicated her career to the health and conservation of wild and domestic animals and the health of the environment. She combines a deep understanding of ecology and human impact on populations and ecosystems with clinical practice and team leadership and training expertise in veterinary medicine. So she's using this experience to increase awareness and community support for sustainable Westport's initiatives to enable Westport to become a net zero community by 2050. Please welcome Gately. if we have some, there we go. Good evening. I'd first like to take an opportunity to say thank you to the Saugatuck Congregational Church for organizing tonight's event and for inviting Sustainable Westport to speak. 
As was mentioned, I am only recently a part of Sustainable Westport, a relative newbie, and I think that that's important to mention tonight because when I was approached to join Sustainable Westport, although I've lived in this community for 15 years, I had never heard of it. And so I thought we would take this opportunity tonight to talk a little bit about who we are, what we've done to date, what we're currently working on, and most importantly, how to get all of you involved. I think it's important for us to frame our current position as a community before we get into who Sustainable Westport is. In 2017, Westport's RTM passed a resolution, one of the first of its kind, to become a net zero community by the year 2050 or sooner, where the, where the, excuse me, the community has reduced its impacts across energy, water, and waste so that they are sustainably managed using approaches that are economically viable, of social benefit, and environmentally responsible. Sustainable Westports is in the service of working toward and achieving that mission. And we do that through inspiring, supporting, and connecting three groups within this community. Those are the Westport residents, the town of Westport municipality, and organizations and businesses within Westport. But before I talk about how we do that, a little history. The Green Task Force was assembled in 2006 at the appointment of the first selectman, Jossiloff, in response to climate change, with the objective, one, to generate support for local initiatives, municipal, residential, and commercial, two, to promote educational outreach, and three, to establish specific goals for the reduction of the community emissions over set periods. In the years to follow, the group acted as counsel to the town and accomplished a multitude of achievements, many of which were under the radar of the general public, but qualified the town to earn a bronze certification in 2018 from Sustainable Connecticut. Westport was one of the first Connecticut municipalities to achieve the certification by demonstrating significant achievements across nine sustainable impact areas ranging from thriving local uh, excuse me, economies and vibrant arts and culture to clean transportation and diverse housing. In 2020, the Green Task Force transitioned from a town committee to a nonprofit partner of Earthplace and was renamed Sustainable Westport. The idea behind that was better engagement of the community, the ability to promote businesses and organizations in town that were doing great work while continuing to work with and counsel the town. In 2021, we advanced to silver status certification and were one of only 12 municipalities to earn that. And for note, silver is the highest level that is currently awarded. I also bring this up because subsequent to being awarded silver status, there are now 25 total municipalities. And that's important because Westport has obviously historically been a leader of sustainability, but there are many other municipalities that are catching up and surpassing us. Um, we at Sustainable Westport identified five pillars around which we needed to focus to progress the town, residents, and organizations toward our goal of accomplishing net zero by 2050. The first two of those pillars are energy and buildings. We encourage the transition to reliable, re resilient, and renewable energy, and we support the development of efficient, comfortable, and well-run buildings and infrastructure. To date, there are nine municipal solar installations in which the Green Task Force played an instrumental role. Saugatuck train station here, you can see, was the first installation of solar at a train station in the state of Connecticut. And the solar panels power both the actual structure, but also multiple EV charging stations for commuters and residents. We are also currently collaborating with the town in the Green Building Awards. This is where we encourage and reward residents and businesses who have made significant contributions in sustainability in their design, remodel, or new construction, and even landscaping. This award was uh, started in 2017, ran through COVID, stopped, and we are currently relaunching that with an exciting new project. 
We've also organized and promoted multiple residential campaigns around energy efficiency to date. The Neighbor to Neighbor Challenge, Solarize Connecticut Campaign, and free energy audits for residents in Westport. Transportation, we promote clean and convenient choices for transportation. Westport, as you all likely know, has the highest per capita rate of EVs in the United States. And we're fortunate that we have engaged and progressive municipal employees. Chief Police Fodi uh, purchased this police vehicle for the force. It was the first police vehicle east of the Mississippi to be purchased. Since that time, he has added to his fleet and is widely considered a leader across the state. Sustainable Westport worked with the town to draft an EV purchasing policy for the municipal fleet. We've worked with P&Z and the BOE um, to connect them with organizations that host EV webinars. We partner with other local sustainable organizations and the EV Club of Connecticut on webinars and electric vehicle showcase events like this EV parade that was hosted. And we currently and excitingly have an opportunity to secure EPA funding for electric school buses in Westport. And we are working with the BOE and the administration toward that at this time. Sustainable Westport supports the transit district commuter shuttles. For those of you who don't know about this, this is wheels to you. It's an effective on-demand, cost-effective, excuse me, on-demand shuttle service to the train station via a super cool downloadable app. We advocate for making the town more walkable and bikeable, and we educate and promote carpooling, e-bikes, and alternate modes of transportation. Resources and waste management. We educate and encourage residents to become stewards of natural resources and waste management. Westport implemented a glass recycling pilot program this past February, where residents are asked to separate their glass from single stream recycling and drop that glass at the transfer station in a dedicated container. Sustainable Westport has been working with the town to promote the program and educate why it's important. Removing our glass leads to far more efficient recycling. While glass is typically a highly recyclable item, currently only 33% of glass is recycled in the United States. We are collaborating with the Downtown Planning and Implementation Committee working on some informational, uh, there we go, uh, public signage around recycling and how to recycle right. Uh, these were stickers that we developed with DPIC to be installed on the first recycling bins downtown to date. Uh, we are working with local restaurants and the Center for Ecotechnology, which is an EPA, USDA, and Connecticut Deep funded program to promote better waste diversion techniques in restaurants, including food scrap recycling, food donation with Food Rescue US, and incorporating sustainable practices into their business. This is a photo of the Welk Group. They're the first group that has signed on with us, and all three of their restaurants are currently composting. During COVID, we launched a residential zero food waste campaign and advocated for town-sponsored collection of food scraps, free of charge to residents, and were awarded a sizable grant from Sustainable Connecticut to continue promoting this effort. The goal here is to reduce total waste by diverting food waste. This is a great place to get involved on an individual, local level with ties to regional, state, and global outcome. Waste is a crisis. Start by diverting your food. You can learn more about this at our website. And last but certainly not least is community engagement. Developing an aware and engaged community by providing events, resources, and ongoing education. From our involvement in various community events such as a film series partnership with Remarkable Theater and Westport Farmers Market, or a beach cleanup that we partnered with Staples Zero Waste Committee. From our brand new relaunched website, to trash talks and con conscious, excuse me, Fashion Friday on social media. We table at community events. We'll be working with the um, Wakeman Town Farm this coming Saturday and marching in the parade. It's about making Westport residents feel included, empowered, and able to make a difference. It starts with you. 
Westport has lofty goals, but without your participation and voice, we cannot get there. We must demand priority and action from our leaders and our neighbors. You can start by following us on social media. We have both an Instagram and a Facebook account. Check out our new website and sign up for our monthly newsletter. And consider joining the Zero Food Waste Challenge, if even for a trial period of a few months. Thank you for your time and attention tonight. Thank you, Gately. I hope that you got a little bit of a sense of the joy that I mentioned at the beginning of, of this evening, that there is so much already happening here in this community to make a difference um, towards climate justice, and there are so many ways that you can get plugged into that. So at this time, we're gonna invite up um, Peter Boyd and, re and re-invite uh, Reverend Jim to join us on stage. Peter is a lecturer at the Yale School of Environment and a resident fellow at Yale Center for Business and the Environment, and he's going to be moderating our Q&A tonight with Jim. Outside of Yale, Peter advises and coaches on purpose-driven, connected leadership. Internationally, he serves on the UNFCCC's Race to Zero Expert Peer Review Group and advises the Integrity Council for Voluntary Carbon Markets to work with rainforest nations on forest carbon. Here locally, he chairs the advisory board of Sustainable Westport and is the co-warden just down the road at Christ and Holy Trinity. So welcome, Peter. Thank you. And I wanna take a moment as you are settling in, if the ushers, if people have Q&A that they wanna submit, the ushers can come around and grab that. Yeah, please, please get your questions in. Um, otherwise, it's only mine, so. Um, <laughs> Peter's gonna be up here creatively. While, while people are collecting, um, I had the privilege of not only having lunch with Jim this afternoon, uh, but also sitting behind him as he was listening to the fabulous local presenters. And so I, so I saw him thumbs upping, I saw him nodding, I saw him taking notes. Um, so as we're gathering, I just thought, what, what are your reactions to what's going on locally? My goodness. So I, I, I wanna look you all in the eye and say, you are so fortunate to be in a town already engaged in leadership that matters. You really need to know that. So I'm from Vermont, okay? In, in my state, composting is required by law. Ponder that, right? But, but here in your town, you're getting the kind of encouragement that we just heard. Come on, let's try collecting our food waste. And what will happen is, pardon the expression, you will all become, uh, I'll say recruiters. I, 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 I could say a, a more churchy word. Uh, on behalf of uh, the importance of separating your food waste from your recyclables uh, and from your trash. That's, that's only one dimension. The, the, the other thing is, um, uh, I said I grew up in a family of scientists. My brother en ended up being the world's expert on charcoal and um, figured out a way to create charcoal from any organic waste so that you didn't have to use hardwood to create charcoal. And what my brother said about soil was soil was too complicated. No one can understand soil. And that's why he didn't become a soil scientist. So to, to have the, uh, the, the, the Wakeman Town Farm uh, here and teaching you all about the soil under our feet, how to appreciate it and understand it more, how to care for it, and how to incorporate it really into your daily life. Uh, is, it's just such a gift. So I want to applaud you. The final thing I want to say is, um, did, did I detect a, a certain little bit of pride <laughs> in, in the comment about uh, your town being the uh, per capita leader in the country on EVs? Okay, so I come from the town of Norwich which, um, not unlike Westport, is uh, among, if not the most uh, wealthy town in my state. And um, 
we share that kind of pride in Norwich. And what we did, something that you don't need to do because you have so many electric cars here, but what we did in order to motivate people is every time somebody bought an electric car in our little uh, town uh, store, which you know we only have one store in town like this, Dan and Wits, it's if you don't need it, uh, if, you, if we don't have it, you don't need it. That's their slogan. <laughs> uh, uh, they have a, a pole, a flagpole, and we would put you know, little, little colored donuts around that pole for every person that bought an electric car. You know, and then the next year, we would do it for every home that installed a solar panel on it, right? And so you know, we lead the this, this state, I don't know about the nation per capita, uh, in terms of uh, solar installations. Um, but we, we also have a heck of a lot of uh, electric vehicles uh, as well. So I, I feel like, I, honestly, I feel like I'm right at home. Not as much traffic up in Vermont. But other than that, <laughs> other than that, I feel like I'm right at home. And so we're going we're gonna to get some competitive graph and donuts <laughs> as well. Because you did pick up the competitiveness uh, completely. Um, it's like, what? There's eight other silvers? And, and, and did you see Gailey couldn't resist going, there is no gold, by the way. Right. Like, 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 <laughs> Which is um, important. That's so, important. Exactly. Right. That's so, right. But when there is a goal, that's yeah, it. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> we will help write it, and then we'll get it. Um, so we've only got three hours worth of questions, so settle in. Um, the, there's, um, and, and we also had a deal, I think, that anything that, from lunch was open table for this as well. Is that right? That's excellent. <laughs> that uh, means, so we had a fabulous lunch, the two of us, and that means he's going to ask some really hard questions from there's, lunch. There's a, couple, a couple back in here that I've lodged. Um, supply side, I was going to start with that because that was my, my, I had a kind of placeholder question here, but it's been picked up by somebody here, a great one here, on somebody noting that there's been actions in stopping pipelines and what a fantastic uh, sort of first-hand account as well. Uh, so hats off, we've got people like you doing that. Um, the, he's, the, the question here is like, what kind of action has there been in, uh, on the building side, on the supply side, building alternative energy sources, solar, wind, nuclear, and or rebuilding the grid? What, what do you see on that side? Well, so the first thing that comes to mind, and it relates to some things uh, that, that you said, I think, uh, the first thing that comes to the mind is that now uh, there are uh, uh, 63 cities or towns in America that have now have a legal requirement that any new construction in their town cannot use any form of fossil fuel as its primary heating or water heating uh, system. So it must be electric. So 63 towns are the municipal 63 towns municipal or level. cities, including New York, including Los Angeles, and including Brookline. Now, not surprising, there are states now that are passing state laws forbidding the autonomy of towns to make that kind of requirement. And that's happened already in, I don't know how many states, but more than half a dozen states. So if, if you're, if, you know, all of us, of course, particularly on, on tonight, right, are aware of the, uh, uh, you know, enormous ideological conflict that our uh, country is engaged in right now. And, it is most evident in the arena of climate change, and it's making itself manifest in laws. I'll just say one more comment about that that, that you didn't ask, Peter, but it, but it sort of relates to this. And that is, for activists like me, um, there are now 23 states where if you take an action, as I have on more than 20 occasions, to protest what the governor is doing or to protest what a bank is doing or to protest a fossil fuel production site or some such thing, um, you, you will be you run a risk of imprisonment for 10 to 20 years. 23 states have passed that legislation. Oh, by the way, the, the language of the legislation is identical in all those states, just in case you were naive and thinking they were independently developed. They weren't. Yeah. Okay. So on the so <laughs> there you go. And and is that Alec at work? Is it? Uh, there's, there's there's an organization that does very good drafting. You, on you the other side. <laughs> yes, um, indeed, indeed. Um, 
Um, so on the, on the supply side, on the, the positive piece, so the energy side, the solar, the wind, yeah. um, one of the th things I want to get your thoughts on was the indigenized energy, for instance, the, 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 the idea that sort of tribal lands are not only stopping their pipelines now, but actually kind of almost like coming off the grid uh, and putting up solar and wind and as, as the, these things make more sense. Have you seen any in sort of inspiring pieces on your travels? On, on things like that? So uh, communities all over the country are in, in very different ways, uh, are um, uh, initiating um, you know, solar panel installs, some of which combine energy being provided for the town, that's the government, energy being provided for for-profit business, and energy being provided for residential customers, all from one grid. And they actually have, it, this is true in Vermont, but it's true in other places too. They, they, they have that sort of worked out so that if there is a champion such as Sustainable Westport to champion such a thing, then the laws, uh, at least in Vermont and several other places, allow for that kind of combination. Um, so that, that's one example of, of this uh, broad question that you've asked, Peter. But um, the, the other thing is that, it, it, I, I forget if I mentioned this, I, I don't think I mentioned it in my talk. The cost of a solar installation today is one three hundredth the cost when Jimmy Carter put solar on the White House roof. One three hundredth the cost. That's how cheap solar energy is today. And batteries, the cost of batteries, in case, in case instead of having a, a, a diesel power generator, you want to have your lights on when the power goes out, or if you live in Texas, for example, when the power always goes out, uh, that those batteries are coming down in cost at a faster rate than solar panels. So the opportunities for communities like yours, particularly communities that are providing leadership, to, to really somehow figure out what's the next step? What more could we do? You know, what would happen? M might I just ask you this? What would it, I know there's not a county consciousness in Connecticut, but if I may, as an outsider, what would happen if Fairfield County decided the challenge of climate change was so much and the leadership potential of Fairfield County, with a little bit of that pride you were talking about is, is so substantial that Fairfield County should lock arms together in order to provide the world what climate leadership looks like over the next 10 to 20 years. What might be possible with that kind of visioning? And part of my reason for, for um, talking about the county is because Elected officials, you don't have elected officials from your county, that's why I brought it up that way. Elected officials um, have a challenge at hand to figure out how, with whoever it is they represent, to navigate the ideological divides you know, that currently divide our country, right? So maybe we need some new geographic organization principles in order to address the climate crisis. And wouldn't it be something if Fairfield County could provide that? So I'll, I'll just throw that out there. You're throwing it to the right people. I, I, exactly. Um, the, the other thing, just to pick up on what Gately was saying as well, is like, you know, take the zero food waste as a, as a waste crisis. Um, it's a county level felt problem. I mean, yeah. Westport is one of towns that export our waste problem just up the road within the county to Bridgeport. Um, and Norwalk in, in between in the corridor. So by addressing a Fairfield County level piece, it's, there's a regional part to climate change solutions. And, and there are regional consequences, yeah. favorable regional consequences yeah. of that. Let me tell another regional story uh, because it, it really relates to this. Um, many of you will remember, I think it was four years ago, up in northeastern Massachusetts, there was a high pressure natural gas pipeline that exploded, right? And the city of Lawrence, which is Massachusetts' poorest city, and the town of Andover, which is you know, the top five wealthiest towns in Massachusetts, both had, um, uh, not casualties, not deaths, but they had people injured, and, and in Lawrence in particular, dozens, I think it was actually hundreds of homes 
uh, got exploded as a consequence of that. The good people of Andover took in for months and months and months those people who were homeless as a result of this explosion. I had the opportunity uh, two weeks after this event happened to be uh, scheduled to give a public lecture just like this one in the town of Andover. So there were all these folks from Lawrence who were homeless living in Andover, they came, and, and they knew I was gonna talk about climate change which related to their natural gas pipeline that had just blown up. And at the time, um, Eversource was trying to figure out, you know, how much is this gonna cost us to re you know, replace this 100 year old technology? And I challenged those two towns to become a demonstration project. What if instead of in reinstalling 100 year old technology that Eversource was glad to reinstall, why? Because they could charge their ratepayers for that cost. Why not make it a demonstration project for the world and use this opportunity to take the billion dollars or whatever the heck it was going to cost and transition Northeast Massachusetts to wind, water, and solar, which could have happened. It didn't. It didn't. That's the end of the story. It didn't happen. But the price tag for reinstalling 100-year-old technology was $1.25 billion. We need demonstration projects. And those demonstration projects are as technological as they are political, as they are sort of communal, if you will. And, and the kind of capacity for that kind of thinking, people in Westport, you guys understand what I just said, which, which a lot of communities, they just don't get that sort of thing I just said. But I know there are people here tonight who understand it. And whether it's Westport or Fairfield County, you could make happen something that could be a model for the world. Because we're not just talking about the nation, we're really talking about the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's take the, 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 the piece about like, what could happen and the 300th uh, of, of the cost now. There's a question from the audience here, is like, is there anything in the defense of fossil fuels saying that the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow? So here's, here's the thing. The reason I immediately, as soon as I said that how much the price of, of solar panels had dropped, I immediately said, and batteries, that price has dropped farther, is because wind is an intermittent tech, uh, 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 energy provider. Sun is an intermittent energy provider. And you will hear people who carry the opposite set of views from myself focus only on that full stop. And you'll never hear them talk about the price of batteries plummeting faster, really, than any technology in recent history. Batteries is what gets you through that, that intermittency, if you will. Um, and and the, the other thing that's, that's just really, really important, as I said in my talk, um, in, in seven generations, uh, roughly 150 years, we have used half, maybe a little more than half of the energy nature took 150 million years to create. If, just, just take a deep breath, everybody take a deep breath. If we were to build out solar panels only the size of Spain, all right, so get that picture in your head, Spain, right? Not the biggest country, right? It's like a little boot at the end of Europe, right? If we were to cover an area the size of Spain with solar panels, you would have enough electrical energy to supply all the electric needs of the entire world. That's all we need. Can I give you an alternative? If we were to somehow make available 100% of the land surface now occupied by fossil fuel plants. That would be fossil fuel power plants, fossil fuel refineries, open pit coal mines, etc. Right? Everything that has to do with fossil fuel. If you use just that geographic area and covered it all with solar panels, you would have enough electricity to supply the entire world's needs of electricity. What is holding us back? Which turns to the second part of this question, which is what are the most egregious threats that we face in this near, very near future, do you think? So uh, let me give two answers to that question. I think, the, I think the biggest 
threat that we face, my friends, is our human, our human capacity to normalize almost anything. Think about what we did with COVID. And think about the extent to which, sure, there was you know, panic and, and there, I mean, the, the, the number of things we could all say about how, how our life attempted to accommodate power. But somehow what happened is uh, we all made the accommodations needed and there are various ways to description the stage we are at now. But one is that um, we've just sort of fallen into a sense of accepting it as normal. And, and my biggest fear is that the, the, the horrors that await us over the next 10 to 15 years, uh, that human beings have the capacity to normalize that. So that, that's my first answer. In terms of the biggest threat, I, you know, I, I, I made this point in my, in my uh, presentation, uh, but just let me make it a little more clear. How many refugees do we have from the Ukraine so far as a consequence of war? Is it nine million roughly? So, somewhere in that vicinity, right? So I, I talked about if the temperature just goes up 0.4 degrees centigrade more, we're already 1.1 degrees uh, up from normal. If we go up just 0.4 degrees centigrade uh, to 1.5 degrees centigrade rise from, from pre-industrial era, that the tropics may become uninhabitable. And so that's 2.5 billion refugees. So it, 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 when, when, I, when asked this question, I think in human terms, and I think the human terms are that parts of the Earth will become uninhabitable, as parts of the Earth already are, and um, the migration consequence of that will uh, disrupt life in, in hugely significant ways. So I'm, I'm not gonna let that question go, like keep us here. Let, we, we also Please. chatted about hope. Yes. Uh, so what, what are your, what, the, the flip of that, what's currently giving you sort of the most hope and sort of sources for inspiration right now? So, I, so I'm a theologian, right? I, you know, I, I gave up being a scientist when I was 19, and, uh, and, and I, 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 I studied ethics. I, I tried to do a PhD in ethics. I'm dyslexic, so that didn't work out. Uh, so I, so I became a minister, and I ran a few nonprofits, and and uh, and here I am talking about climate change. That's been my passion since the late 1980s. My first climate sermon was in 1988. Um, but the person who gives me most hope is Greta Thunberg. And and of all the things that I could quote from Greta Thunberg, who who is now I I don't know if she's 18 or 19. Uh, of all the things that I could quote from her. She says, hope begins with honesty. And so if you feel, if you go home and report, yeah, I heard this minister talking about climate change, and boy, was he depressing. The, my, part of my point is hope has to begin with honesty. We have to face this. And also the point I made just a moment ago about normalizing things, if we face the realities that we are anticipating we have the possibility of not normalizing them, but of making the changes we need to make so those possibilities don't become our norm. And I would call that resistance, actually, because to do nothing, then that's just going to roll right over us. That momentum of seven generations worth of technology will roll right over us. So what gives me hope is that People are capable of the kind of resistance that society needs in order to make the social transformation that I, I think we all know needs mm -hmm. to, to happen. And when I hear stories, like we heard from our two other presenters, of what y'all been up to here, these become great models for people really realizing this kind of thing has to become a bigger part of every one of our lives. And, you know, as we talked with lunch, and Peter, I would invite you to say anything you want from our, our lunch too, but, but one of the most positive outcomes of our lunch was when I asked Peter a similar question to this, and, and after his answer, I looked at him, I just want you all to know, and I especially want you to hear this, 
I, I said, I can't remember the last time I have said this, but you've given me hope. And that's because this guy here, he's a business guy, like many of you are, right? I'm not a business guy, right? And so you, you heard my talk about business up there. It wasn't the most positive thing in the world, right? <laughs> and, and, and yet, guess what? It's necessary for business to get us out of this mess, right? And a guy like Peter, he can, he can talk about eloquently and in ways that a plain, you know, guy like a minister guy like me can understand. He, he, he makes the presentation of the kind of incremental transitions and some leap transitions that humanity needs to make. And, um, and I came away from that conversation uh, and I came home and said to my wife, you know what, I, I think we're at, humanity is actually capable of making the transition that, that nature says we must. That's a big answer. That's good. Um, and You're and part you, of the answer, if, if, a if, big part. <laughs> the, the one piece for our world, just to explain how, I, like, how did we suddenly talk about hope, um, where we said was that the, there was more of an and answers. We, we came up, I think, combination with a lot of and answers, so that we need the Gretas, that we need the progressive companies, we need the investors. Right. Um, we need the, one of the next questions here is the divest movement, but we also need the engage movement. We need the engine ones. We need the yeah. people that get in at the shareholders yeah. of the dirty companies yeah. and, tr and have the patience to turn, yeah. as well as enough of it, well, 40 trillion, that is actually yeah. turning their backs as well. So we need, we need, we need it all. Yep. Um, so we were talking about that. Um, on, we, we, and we can come up to some more hope later. But, the, 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 but mis on this idea of divestment, um, there's one here about, like you talked about the financial oil and gas divestment strategies. Can we do the same divestment moral strategy with donations to politicians? No oil money or no votes. <laughs> So there have been political contests. I can't quote them exactly right now because they just don't come to my mind immediately. Wherein one candidate, go, you know, go, you know, one candidate going against another one, one of the candidates has said, has made the pledge, I will not take any money from fossil fuel companies. The, the, these these uh, uh, contests have played themselves out in the past four years. Uh, in our country. Unfortunately, I, I, don't, I don't have like a scorecard as to, well, how did that work? Um, the, the reality is the, the uh, financial uh, backing of politicians, not only in the Republican Party, but also in the Democratic Party, uh, is huge um, from fossil fuel companies. Um, it's, it's absolutely huge. But, but also let me make, it, it's not a direct answer to this question, but it, but it sort of follows from what I, I just said, and I, I don't want to miss the opportunity to get it out here. The leaders, the, uh, the political leaders in states that are heavily fossil fuel dependent, so you know, West Virginia comes to mind, Montana comes to mind, Wyoming comes to mind, um, Kentucky comes to mind. Um, those political leaders are failing their constituency for not having led the transition which all of them know is absolutely inevitable, okay? My dad was born and, and raised in West Virginia, and uh, some of you, has anybody here visited the Coal Museum in West Virginia? You have. When did, when did you visit? Oh, years ago? Yeah, a long time. Well, guess what? The Coal Museum is now heated by solar panels. <laughs> So it's, it's really important for, for all of us to understand, of course there is this ideological battle that is going on in America right now, um, but that doesn't mean that there is actually a group of people with brains in their head who, who, who like don't believe in climate change because it's not a matter of belief. It's got nothing to do with belief. It has to do with like third grade science. That's, that's what we're talking about here. So never make that mistake, um, at least. That was only a partial answer to your question. Well, there's lots more in there. But we can come back to West Virginia later. There, there's a good one. Moving on to food. Um, there's, there's a great one in here. Because uh, um, I think we've got a local answer, potentially, uh, to some of these, as well as your, your, your national answer. Can you connect the dots between sustainable farming and organic food and the climate crisis? How does our food choices impact the climate? So... The, the, the key, connect the dot, and, and I will, after saying this, you know, defer to our experts over here. The key is that the fertilizer required 
to do mega farming all comes from fossil fuel. So fossil fuel is the lever that allowed agribusiness to take over. And by the way, the green revolution. So, so, so I, when I was a kid, like when I was five years old, I would wake up at seven o'clock on Saturday morning and watch Modern Farmer. Any, anybody else, any, any other takers on that? No, no one else, see? <laughs> and, and, and Classic, that's, just me then. And that's because, <laughs> that's because my grandfather, uh, who, whose name was McAdam, uh, made small farm tool implements um, up on Lake Ontario. And I was just fascinated with, with farm machinery and stuff. And I thought the Green Revolution was a great thing until I learned that, in fact, the Green Revolution was about shifting from more organic means of farming, which we'll hear more about in a moment, uh, to uh, this mega farming, which really requires petroleum. To, to drive the fertilizer engine. Um, I'll, I'll invite... Yeah, can I, can I add a yeah, question? Because I please. was thinking, build on any of the things that Jim said, and also a lovely local one for, how does it work with food scraps brackets in Westport that are not great for compost, like meat? What is it, what, what is, how does it work when it's all mixed together? And I know we've got a local answer to that too. Last question. Oh, can I do one question at the end after that? Just one. There's a microphone right, right in front of you I mean, on, saving on the view. One. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Uh, so I will build on your answer about food and how that is intrinsically linked to climate change, which it is. Um, so local food, so both local and organic foods, um, the banana that we're buying from Stop and Shop was not grown here. Um, and the way that that gets here is an impact on, um, it uses fossil fuels to be transported to our community. Um, so focusing on local foods um, and also benefiting local farmers. So in our community, our local farmers are using these organic practices. Um, and in comparison, these agribusinesses, industrial agriculture, are um, diminishing our soils, which impacts um, how hot our earth becomes. Um, and really our lands were not built to sustain the amount of meat that we're eating, the amount of food um, that we are producing and also not necessarily eating. So the other piece, my other expertise is in food waste, which we will hear about after. But, um, food in landfill produces um, 20 to 25 percent more methane gas than, um, no, 20, what's my stat? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm a little nervous. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, so food, so it's or, buying organic, buying locally, and reducing your food waste. The only things that I would add on to that to consider are, one, the use of water in agri-farming, I mean, egregious use of water, and water conservation is a very significant issue. And two, to the point of transportation, is also packaging. When you go to the grocery store and you buy something, look at, they're now wrapping cucumbers individually. So you consider the plastic, the cardboard, the styrofoam, all of those things are contributing to our waste crisis and would not be utilized if you were buying locally or growing your food yourself. The other yeah. food scrap question, <laughs> zero food waste campaign over here, um, is that commercial, there are, so Westport is very fortunate in that there are two commercial haulers. You don't need to be a home composter. And so composting at home, while it's super exciting, uh, presents a number of challenges, and oftentimes home composters cannot put things like meat, bones, um, eggshells. There's a number of different things that they don't want to put into their compost bins. The commercial haulers, because they are processing this food or working with places that process this food in a different way, are able to accept any organic matter. So mm. all of your bones, shells, coffee grinds, coffee filters, uh, food soiled paper towels and napkins, you're able to capture a lot more waste by using these, um, these sources. Wow. Excellent, there you go.
So you're taking some tips back to I, I am. I am taking them back to the Not that we're competitive or anything. <laughs> um, um, but now, so last question. I got, I got my shepherd's crook over here. Um, <laughs> la last question to, for, for you to leave everybody with. Um, I I, I, many things you said, I think, resonated with lots of us. And it, it was coming through in the questions. And, and apologies to anyone that I missed. I think I hopefully got most of, most of the spirit, of, if not the letter, of everybody's question. Um, but one of the things you said about this idea of the, of the appropriate weight of this gratitude of living in the most consequential time. And it's been said by Obama and others about sort of we're the, the, la the last generation to be able to do anything about it and the first generation to know enough to know what to do. Um, and, and, and so we've got that weight, but then on the other hand, we've got the, the lightness of all the moves that we've heard from Gately and, and, and Haley and others on terms, of, almost like leave us with a sort of, what do you want everyone to walk away with? that mixture of that appropriate weight of gratitude of this consequential time and the stuff to, that we need to do differently when we leave? So this is a, a wonderful question. And uh, I, I want to, even, even though I'm sitting up here with a collar on, I want to assure you that the intention of what I am about to say is not, it has nothing to do with religion. It, 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 it's a secular intention that, that behind what I'm saying. And, and that is, if, if if you can try to engage the discipline of gratitude by waking up in the morning with gratitude in your heart and on your mind, and just ask yourself, what gifts do I have? Now, for the religious side, what gifts have I been given? Okay, that, but the two are really the same. What gifts do I have that I could put to use today in order to begin to address the, the challenge of living in this most consequential time. And you might come up with something different every day. It's really obvious, hearing from myself and our other two presenters, and, and also from Peter, that the opportunities are just so many. And, uh, you know, what risk could I take today maybe to influence a person that I know uh, has a lot of sway and cares about my opinion? What risk could I take today that would begin to address this challenge that I happen to have been born into? One of the things I point out to audiences is, you know, back in 1941, there was a young man living in Texas who was the son, uh, he, was, he was 18 years old, and he was the son of an oil family. And like many, many, many families, he could have fought his way out of the draft, and he didn't. And years later, he became president, George Bush, right? And we are in a situation like him. We in Westport, we in Norwich, my town. Most of us probably have enough assets that we can find a way forward that climate change won't have a very big impact on our personal life and maybe on the life of our children. That depends on how many assets we have. But surely, no one who is attending tonight wants to live that way. So I invite you, wake up with gratitude in your heart, let it find its way to your mind, and ask the question, of all the gifts I have, how might I find a new way to address the climate crisis? And, um, and, and every day, seek that opportunity. Because that's the situation we're in. Every single one of you is needed. And if we start to leverage our contacts, now I, I know I'm shifting the language when I start talking about leveraging our contacts, right? Or I might say calling in all of our chits. That's, I'm, I'm changing the language when I put it that way, but I'm aware of that because that's what we need to do. And that's the opportunity that's been given us. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter and Jim, for a wonderful conversation. And thank you to Gately and Haley for being here to present. And thank you to each of you for being here. Yes.
And I have so much gratitude for each of you for joining us tonight. So thank you. And go forth with gratitude and joy. Here, here.